All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to Standard Uranium's Live Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. We are joined today by John Bay, President and CEO, and Sean Hilliker, Project Geologist. John and Sean will walk us through a company presentation, and then we'll be accepting questions live. So you can submit your questions at any time on the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the screen, and we'll get to them after the presentation. And as always, the summit is being recorded and will be available to watch afterwards on six.com. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, John, to get things started. Thank you, Dasha, and thank you for six for hosting us today. And thank you to all the participants who are joining in and watching us and hearing our story for the first time or coming back to see us again. So today, Sean and I are gonna walk you through our corporate presentation give those who are new to the story a quick uh, overview of what we're doing and who we are. And those who know our story, you're probably going to want to know about what's happening with our recent winter drill program. So we're going to talk a bit about that and what we have planned for our summer program as well. So let's kick things off. Uh, once again, Sean Hilliker, our project geologist, is on here with me, and he's going to be joining in in a few minutes. So once again, here we go. Standard uranium. We find the fuel for a new clean energy future. Here's our legal disclaimer. You can take a look at that in your own time. We will, we will be making some forward-looking statements today. So the macro story right now is uh, an incredible time in the uranium sector and the nuclear energy sector. You can see from this slide there are several things that have happened in the last few weeks and months that are pretty exciting for uranium. Number one, um, the equity market. It's really starting to tick along now. We're seeing uh, you know all our peers as well as us start to move up nicely. There's been some huge gains for, for some companies, which is excellent to see. Um, are we at the start of a new uranium bull market? We think so, and I think a lot of our analysts and peers believe so as well. Some say we're in any one or any two in a, in a baseball analogy. Um, one thing that's happened recently in the last several weeks, we're seeing lots of money flowing into the uranium sector, primarily going into the ETF, which is then flowing into the junior equity space as well. Uh, we're looking at the U.S. government, who is now uh, supporting uranium, both on both sides of the table. So we're seeing that Democrats, as well as the Republicans, both saying that nuclear has to be part of the clean energy future, and that is very bullish for the uranium sector. We're seeing the uh, spot price, you know, moved from thirty dollars down to twenty-seven, and back up to thirty-one in the last few weeks, primarily based on some of our uranium peers coming into the space and buying buying uranium from the spot market, which is another pretty exciting thing. And it's, I don't think it's ever happened before. And hopefully that is going to jolt the uh, utilities into moving to sign long-term contracts uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, we're also seeing um, nuclear being added to ESG funds. So in Europe this week, they said it's a, it is now uh, considered a clean energy and will be available for, for clean energy investments, which is spectacular. So watch for more money to flow into the uranium sector and nuclear sector. And of course, COVID-19 is still happening. We're still seeing uh, Cigar Lake shut down right now. We're not sure when it's coming back online. Uh, experts will uh, say maybe in the next few months. I know uh, Chemical and Tim Gitzel are giving a talk right now, and they're probably going to be addressing that. Uh, it's been down already for several months, and that's taken uh, more supply offline. And of course, small modular reactors. We haven't talked much about this, and many of the experts are, haven't even put the uh, demand in their, in their future models yet from what the uranium demand could be from small modular reactors. We think it's very exciting. We know they're coming. They should be operational in the late 2020s, and that will have another demand on the uranium space, so another positive in the uranium, in the uranium sector. Let's take a look more about standard uranium, what we're up to. So for those that are new to us, we are a Canadian junior uranium exploration company. We're focused in Saskatchewan, primarily the Athabasca Basin, and we have three project areas. The Southwest Corner is our Davidson River project, which is our flagship, and we're going to be talking a lot, a lot about that today. In the north, we have our Sundog project up near Uranium City, and then we have our Eastern Basin project on the eastern side of the basin, which we'll get to in the end of the presentation. So a bit of a company snapshot here. So you can see this picture which shows our Davidson River project and where it lies in the southwest corner. But first of all, a little bit more about Standard. We were a private company up until May of this of 2020 when we took the company public. Uh, following the public listing, we raised $8 million last year and we put that directly into exploration programs. So we did our summer exploration program at the Davidson River, followed up by our winter program, and now we're gearing up for our next drill program this summer. Uh, we built our team, our company, around the Davidson River project. We've hired and brought on experts in this specific region who have had exploration success in the uranium space, making discoveries in this region, which is crucial when you're building a team specifically focused on making a high-grade uranium discovery. 
our short-term catalysts. We're going to be announcing our, uh, you know, our assay results in the next several weeks, probably around mid-May, and then we're going to follow it up with a 10,000-meter drill program this summer. Now, that number is is monumental for us. In the last year, we we haven't even done 10,000 meters. We had our, our first program was just over 5,000, and then our winter was 3,000. So, for us to announce we're quadrupling the size of our summer program is a strong statement by us, and, and really exciting for our shareholders. Uh, once again, we're also going to be doing some work in the north on our Sundog project uh, this winter, this summer, sorry, followed up by uh, uh, ground gravity and a drill program aiming for the winter of 2022. So exciting things ahead for Standard Radio. If you look at this graph right now, this is what we call the, the Lasson curve. And what's really important about this graph is it shows you where Standard Uranium is. So we are this. You can see our logo there. We're right at the start of the speculation phase, which means we are pre-discovering, which means our, our share price and valuation hasn't accounted for our discovery yet. So it's an incredible time for shareholders to come along and join with us if they believe that we are on, 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 the, on the heels of making a uh, higher value discovery. Uh, a couple of things that is important to notice here, uh, I'm not just sitting back and doing nothing. We are doing a lot of things behind the scenes, a lot of marketing, a lot of promotion. We were telling our story, building the foundation, letting people know who we are, building our brands, that we do make that discovery. Uh, our share price has a huge opportunity to really accumulate and make and grow from there because people want to know who we are and what we're up to. Um, the last uh, few peers who have made discoveries in this region, they made it in bear markets and still the share price went up in you know, 20x. So as we enter this new bull market, for us to make a discovery, there's huge potential for our share price to really move beautifully and our share will be very happy with that. If you look at the team we built, I'm going to talk about our board and on our management team. So myself, I come from the capital market space. I've been in this space for 15 plus years, uh, working in multiple sectors, from gold, silver, lead, and uranium, as well as worked on multiple exchanges. So good capital markets experience and good mining experience. Uh, we have Neil McCallum as our VP of Exploration, who's been working in the Octobasque Basin for 15 plus years, primarily with Daru's Geologic, where he is one of the senior geologists there. Uh, we then added Garrett Ainsworth the day after he left next and he joined our team. And we'll talk a bit more about Garrett and why that's important. Garrett is the geologist that made the radioactive boulder discovery, which led to Fission's triple R discovery. And then he went and worked with NextGen for many years as a VP of exploration and helped advance the Aero project. So he knows this region better than almost anyone in the world. Uh, we have Blair Jordan, who came to us uh, shortly after we started the company. He's a lead independent director. He's a uh, a banker and a lawyer by trade and brings several uh, years of capital markets experience. And recently we added Kenneth Judge. Ken is a good friend of mine and a lawyer, corporate uh, M&A security specialist. So he came on board to help us with our corporate governance, our capital markets and M&A work. Looking at uh, Martin Bajic, who is our CFO. Martin works with multiple junior companies and has great experience in the capital markets in Canada and multiple exchanges. We had a Galen McNamara this past year. Galen also comes to us from, from NextGen, where he worked closely with Sean and Gary Ainsworth as a project geologist there and working on the aero discovery. Uh, Sean Hillicker joined us last year. Sean is our project geologist who is leading our drill programs at, at the Davidson River Project. Sean recently completed uh, his master's degree in the PGO, and his master's degree was actually on the aero deposit. So nobody knows those rocks better than Sean. So having him on our team is a huge success. And anyone that's watching us on social media has gotten to know Sean and see uh, his ability to communicate what we're doing and why that's important to our, our shareholders. And most recently, we added Lori Thomas. Lori is our VP of Investor Relations. Lori comes to us from many years of working in Saskatchewan in the uranium sector, both with Cameco for 10 plus years and also with UEX. So great to have uh, this team that is uh, Saskatchewan focused with incredible experience in this region. Now let's take a look at the southwest corner of the Athabasca Basin and see where the companies are around there and why that's important. So if you look at this map, you can see those red stars. We have the Spitfire Zone, the Aero Deposit, and the Triple R. Those are all recent and very important discoveries that have happened in this region. And you can see um, from the chart on the right, there's been, you know, uh, 600 plus holes drilled on both the Triple R and the Aero Deposit. And Spitfire's had 100 plus holes and Smart Lakes had uh, many holes. And then we, our David's River project, we've only had 20 holes. We are just getting started on this on this drilling campaign, and it's really exciting to see the results that we're getting already, and we're hot on the tails of what we believe could be the next big uranium discovery in this region. All right, over to this uh, Clearwater Domain Mirror Theory slide. So what we really wanted to prove out on uh, our first program and our second program primarily was that 
the Clearwater Domain theory is that the, the is Clearwater Domain is the host and the, the source of the uranium and the fluid that came into this region that dropped out the uranium potentially. So if you look on this slide, you can see a lot of squiggly lines. Those are conductors. Now those conductors are primitively graphitic and sulfitic conductors, and that is where you find uranium in this region. So first thing we had to do with our with our geophysics, our V10 and Z10, was prove that we had those uh, conductors on a project, and then drill into those and see if we could find uranium and prove that uh, it's the same type of rock formations on the western side of the of the Clearwater Main that are found on the eastern side. Now the guys who know what they were looking at on the eastern side, we have Derek and Galen and Sean. So it's exciting when we're getting our drill core back and they're telling us, you know, this is the type of core we're seeing over on the arrow and this is why that's important and this is how we're going to plan our next drill hole. So I'm going to pass it over to Sean now to get deeper into the technical side of the next several slides and then we're going to let him tell us a bit about what we've recently done at the Davidson River and what we're looking to do with our winter, our sorry, summer upcoming program. So Sean, uh, take it away. Tell us a bit more about the Clearwater Domain and, and this region and why that's important for standard uranium. Sounds good, John. Um, so as you mentioned, it's uh, this large geological feature. You can see it on the map there. It's a large intrusive body. Uh, so coming up from the mantle, a bunch of related with fluids and some structural disturbance in the area. So you can see those squiggly lines, those conductors that John was talking about kind of bending around that uh, clear water domain feature. So there's a large uh, crustal scale structure, a big fold. The rocks are all bent up around uh, to the northwest there. So we believe that the Patterson Lake corridor, which we know is uranium fertile, uh, bends up through the Clearwater domain and through our Davidson River project down in the southwest corner there. So that was kind of like John mentioned, the first kind of thing we wanted to prove out uh, with our first inaugural drill programs. And, uh, and we had some success in do doing that. We're seeing the same sorts of structures the same sorts of rock types that we uh, observed over at the Patterson Lake Corridor. So very important to have that kind of basic geological setting uh, when we're looking for these high grade uranium deposits. Um, so as John had mentioned as well, um, we're looking for blind deposits is what we call them in this region. We have no rocks at surface, no outcrop. Um, so we have to rely on drill uh, or geophysical surveys to find out our drill targets. So this map shows just a bunch of different layers of different types of surveys. So in 2018 and 2019, uh, the company carried out uh, a number of different geophysical surveys on the Davidson River property. Uh, you can see our four major trends on the property, Saint, Warrior, Bronco, and Thunderbird. And uh, we focused on the Warrior trend for our phase one inaugural drill program, which we'll get into in a, in a slide or two here. And, uh, and we actually just put our first drill hole in the St. Trend uh, this winter. So what we're looking for when we're searching for these high grade basement hosted deposits is a number of different geophysical ingredients. So we're looking for, first off, these conductors, which we know we have. There's lots on the property. And we're looking specifically where those structures bend and break apart. So cross cutting structures that affect them, that overprint them and break those rocks up, as well as where, where these conductors are most conductive. So that's what we mean when we talk about EM bright spots or electromagnetic bright spots. So we can identify these different zones that look more interesting than others and prioritize our drill targets and really pick the areas that look most interesting to uh, spend money on a drill hole. So once we did that, we uh, went up and uh, did our first maiden drill program at Davidson River uh, last summer uh, through to September. And during the peak kind of COVID times in the north, uh, it was a immensely successful program, uh, no problems with health and safety, no outbreaks, uh, the drilling and everything went smooth. So it was great, great to have all our vendors up there, aggressive and access helicopters and uh, working together with Big Bear Camp, staying out of there. Everything worked out great. We managed to drill 13 holes, uh, totaling about 5,600 meters. And as I said, we just focused on that warrior trend. So you can see all the different holes that we drilled in 2020 along the trend. We took some aggressive step outs uh, to the northwest and down to the southeast along strike and focused a few drill fences and uh, other, other drill holes in that main sort of yellow colored area, which is a large EM bright spot, like I was talking about. So looking for, 
the areas where these conductors are broken up, those are the, the dashed ellipses on the map. Those are interpreted breaks in the conductor. So those are the areas that are very interesting geologically. So we, as I kind of alluded to, we kind of tested out that clear water domain mirror theory, uh, proved out that we have the same sort of structures, uh, looking at stacked shear zones, um, with graphite and sulfides in them and similar garnetiferous basement rocks and uh, as well as associated alterations. So we tested the warrior conductor along strike and uh, got our geochem back, had some anomalous pathfinder elements such as boron and some really good structure that we intersected. So uh, we were able to identify several follow-up targets and kind of refine our search along warrior. So now we'll step through uh, what we did in our, the first portion of our phase two drill program this winter. We uh, drilled seven holes totaling 3,020 meters. So we sank six more holes um, along the warrior trend following up on some of the results that we had from phase one. And then we, as I said, we punched our first hole into the same trend, which was very exciting. So one of the things about winter drilling, um, we pushed a road in so there's an access trail on the map there. You can see the green line. So we were able to save a lot of costs by using skid drills. I'm sure lots of people have seen our videos that we put out uh, telling you about the difference between those, but huge, huge savings with uh, helicopter time. So we were able to uh, access all these targets on land and not have to rely on the helicopter. So despite some of the uh, challenging winter conditions that Northern Saskatchewan decided to throw at us this year, um, I mean, we started the, the season off with minus 50 to 55 almost every day. So that was a bit of a challenge. And then it totally did a 180 and went the other way. And it was plus 15 uh, at the end of the program. So despite those kind of challenges, you know, working with water in the freezing cold and then, you know, trying to maintain our road when things were warming up and starting to get a bit muddy, um, the team did a fantastic job. And, uh, and we successfully completed the program, no problems as far as health and safety again. And uh, big thanks to Big Bear Aggressive and uh, our water contractors for that again. So one of the things, I just wanna take you through some of the uh, highlights from, from the winter program. So as a geologist, we had to get some, of course, get some rock photos in the presentation for you guys to actually see what we're getting into. Um, so there's a few pictures on the slides here, a uh, couple from hole 16 along the warrior corridor and our first hole uh, number 18 on the same corridor. So one of the, we were following up on these major structures, like I mentioned from phase one, um, and we, we really intersected some of the best looking structures, I think, uh, that we've seen so far along warrior. So as I kind of alluded to before as well, uh, the geometry of these things is really important. Um, and just drawing on arrow as an analogy, uh, we have these stacked conductors, so these stacked high strain zones, shear zones. I'm sure you've heard these terms before, but basically stacked structures all kind of in a row and uh, intersect those as we go down the drill hole. And that's what arrow looks like as well. So we're looking for these deep seated zones where there's lots of structural disturbance and alteration at depth. So in that uh, first picture number or letter A there, there's a, a big brittle reactivated uh, shear zone in there, lots of graphite going through there, lots of clay alteration, and uh, as well as some hydrothermal chloride that we call pseudoite. Uh, assay depending, we, we're just waiting for the results to confirm that mineralogy, but uh, it looks really similar to the alteration that, uh, that we see, you know, proximal to the arrow deposit. And so it's, it's great to see these signs to, you know, kind of keep vectoring us in on uh, where we want to be to make that high grade discovery. So great to see these stacked shear zones along Warrior, uh, high concentrations of graphite and uh, good alteration minerals. Over at Saint, uh, we only unfortunately could drill one hole before we had to shut down because of the weather, um, but some more good structure and some good alteration uh, over at Saint as well. So that first uh, top picture there, D, is the top of hole. So there's the Devonian sandstones on top. And then the red line is the unconformity where the basement rocks begin. So we're looking for the high grade uranium in those basement rocks, structurally controlled, looking for these big zones of broken up rock. So you can see all of that rock at the top of the basement is totally rubble, uh, highly clay altered and friable, soft, 
and broken up. So that's always a great sign. And then deeper in the hole, we uh, hit a highly solidified phylonite. So this thing has been pumped full of quartz. So a really good indication of fluid movement, which is what we're looking for. And then below that and above, actually, it's uh, bound by moderately graphitic high strain zones. So these graphite and sulfide bearing shear zones, again, uh, over on the same corridor. So great things to see in our first hole over there. And uh, there's lots to test still along that corridor. And we're really excited to get back and hit it hard with uh, with a big program this summer. And uh, we actually have a caller ready, sitting there all cleared and, and ready to go for uh, our first hole this summer. So pretty excited for that. Okay, so now I'm just gonna touch on a bit uh, for the summer program that we're planning at Davidson River um, this year. Um, as John announced, you know, we're, we're quadrupling our meterage, which is ex insanely exciting for me as a geologist up there. Uh, the more holes, the better, and obviously increases our chances of uh, making that next high-grade uranium discovery. So we're going to get up there. We have 10,000 meters planned, um, and we're going to follow up more on the Warrior Corridor again. Lots of lots of hope there still. Uh, lots of good structures that we intersected. Like I said, some of the best ones we've seen so far. And like I said as well, we're going to get back and hit, uh, hit that same trend as well, uh, which should be road accessible as well still and uh, step to the to the northwest along there. So that map shows all the our kind of general target areas that we want to hit uh, in the red circles. So we're also going to be flying heli supported drill rigs again uh, this summer. So we're going to get over to our Bronco trend and break ground there for the first time. And uh, we also have some holes that we want to drill over on Thunderbird to, to break ground there as well. So we'll be doing aggressive follow ups uh, along strike of Warrior and Saint and uh, also breaking ground on Bronco and Thunderbird for the first time. So the best part about this whole program is, you know, our relationships that we've built working up here over the last couple of seasons. I mean, the company's still new, but our relationships have been, you know, just they're invaluable for our, our work up there. So we're for, fully per permitted. We have uh, our consent from our First Nations partners up there. We have all of our vendors secured. And we are scheduled to start drilling probably about mid-June uh, through to August. So really exciting times to be to be involved with standard uranium. So now we're just going to switch gears here a little bit, and we're going to go up north to our Sundog project and just take a take a look at what we're what we got going up there. So the project is 100% owned by Standard, um, and again we're targeting high-grade basement hosted unconformity related uranium. Um, so traditionally in this area, it hasn't really been explored for, uh, I don't know, a number of years, like 40, 50 years. And so we're kind of taking our modern exploration techniques, our modern knowledge and understanding of these types of deposits and applying that to an area that hasn't been, you know, explored for, uh, for a number of years. So you can see on that map there, that, uh, yellow, yellow black line there is the edge of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, on Lake Athabasca there. So we have a number of target areas that lie just within just within the, the margin of the basin. So we know that we have high grade uranium at surface up there um, and we have a lot of historical work to go off of. Um, so a number of uh, geophysical surveys, uh, historic drill holes with uh, decent U308 grades in them. And we also have a good idea of what kind of rock types we're looking at. So again, these graphite, and chloride bearing metasedimentary rocks. Uh, these are soft, they're gonna shear. These are the types of rocks that uh, we like to see up there. And so lots to follow up on uh, up at Sundog. So just zooming in a little bit closer uh, to our Javan and Haven target areas. And just to show you a couple of photos as well. So as I mentioned, we had some guys up there uh, kind of confirming those historical results. So we. Did it, ran a sampling program up there last uh, last fall, and we got grades up to uh, just over three and a half percent at surface within the sandstone, um, and that was at our uh, sky target area on Johnston Island. So fantastic results to see uh, at surface, and lots to follow up on at depth. So the whole the whole idea here is lots of times you'll have your sandstone package up top and then your basement rocks below we're looking for the basement hosted uranium deposits like we said um, but lots of times you will get uranium up at that unconformity and then up into the sandstone as well 
So that's kind of what we think we're looking at here. We know we have uranium up perched in the sandstone above the basement. So we want to follow up on those basement roots of the system and, uh, and follow up and try and discover, you know, those high grade roots where, where this stuff's coming from. So there's a good rock photo there in the bottom right corner. You can see all that yellow colored uh, mineral on, on the rock there. That's all secondary oxidized uranium mineralization. So great things to see and lots of big radioactive trends to follow up on. So we're going to get up there. We're going to do a little bit more surveying. Uh, we're going to do some ground uh, gravity to get some high resolution gravity geophysics, and then also might run some, uh, some UAV uh, magnetics as well to get some high, uh, high definition magnetic information. And then we're going to go mapping and uh, we're, you know, in the process of our engagement uh, up there right now and things are going well. So we're uh, on, uh, on a good track to uh, get a, a drill program planned and going for uh, uh, 2022. So now we're gonna fly over to the Eastern side of the basin. Uh, again, we have uh, some 100% owned projects over here. We have three of them, Atlantic, Canary and Ascent. Um, they are in a well explored region of the Athabasca Basin over on the East side. All the classic high grade deposits, MacArthur River, Cigar Lake, um, as well as operating mills uh, are over here. And uh, another thing to note on the map there is ISO Energy's hurricane uranium zone that was uh, that they've been uh, kind of proving out here in the last uh, last couple of years. So it's great, great to be in good company again over on the side of the basin. Um, the east side, like I said, is really you know heavily explored, but where we are to the to the northeast is been a bit underexplored relatively. Um, so you can see on the map there those again squiggly lines. Um, those are our conductors, and then all those uh, blue circles are. Uh, historical drill holes. So lots of drill dr drilling over on this area, uh, but not much on our properties. So lots to follow up on over here, lots of good targets. Again, we're looking for the high grade uh, unconformity related uranium deposits, uh, basement roots, and then up in the sandstone as well. And uh, there's also been um, lots of uh, recent exploration over here that's kind of creating excitement. So really excited to get these permitted up and uh, and get going on these as well. So I'll pass it back to John now. That's probably enough technical talk for now. So <laughs> thanks, guys. Hey, thank you, Sean. That was a great, great summary of all the projects we're working on right now. I'm sure we'll we'll come back and answer a number of questions that have popped up on our screen as well. But let me take us to the last couple of slides, and then we'll come back and we'll answer those questions for our for our audience. So number one, here's our our share structure slide. Uh, it's important to note that uh, we listed on the TSX venture last May. And then we followed it up with an OTC listing this past January, and we're also listed on the Frankfurt Exchange. We now have just under uh, 93 million shares, and our market cap's just over uh, 23 million as of as of yesterday. The bottom of the slide it talks about uh, it shows you know who some of our uh, key investors are um, outside of management insiders. We've got uh, Station Co, who's started investing with us back in 2018, and they've been uh, strong shareholders ever since that time. We invited. Um, you know, L2 Capital, Marcelo Lopez to join us. And he came in in 2019 and has continued staying with us. And then uh, Guy Keller and Tribeca came in uh, at the end of 2019 and that capital raise. And then Azari's capital came in in our last capital raise as well. So these are all uranium specific funds that have believed in us. Um, some when we were private as we were going public and some have come in as we've been a public company. And uh, it's great, uh, you know, sign from them to continue with us and have belief in where we're headed. Um, let's take it to the next slide. Uh, this is an, uh, gives you an idea of you know where our share price is and and where our volume is. So it's really important to note we were first going public in May. You know from that first you know several months our volume wasn't that great, but in the last three or four months you know we're we're averaging over you know 500,000 shares traded on the TSX venture and upwards of 750 to a million shares overall trading each day, which is remarkable and we're really happy to see that uh, liquidity. Our share price has ticked up from a low of 12 cents just a few months ago up to 25 cents as of yesterday which is great to see and as we are preparing for our summer drill program with a mass of uh, 10,000 meters we anticipate strong shareholder support as we as we progress to that as well if you look on the right on um, this graph sort of shows us uh, starting at about 26 cents we actually went public at 15 cents and here we are today up at 25 cents so it's been sort of up and down it was up to 36 cents i believe during our summer program last year uh, and then it sort of came back down between our drill programs and then moved back up again into the 20s uh, during our winter program. So it's always great to see the, 
good shareholders for great liquidity. And as the uh, uranium market picks up, we anticipate that it's going to be strong uh, share price movement for standard uranium as well. Uh, going into our, our last slide here, just a bit of a summary of what we've talked about today. So we are uh, you know, an exploration team which has been built specifically to make a high-grade uranium discovery in the southwest corner. Uh, the Davidson River pro project is one of the greatest land packages we believe in this region. Uh, we went public in May of last year. We uh, raised uh, $8 million last year, uh, led by uh, Red Cloud and Eventus Capital. Uh, we brought in a lot of different uh, shareholders, and we've got a, a great uh, list of shareholders right now supporting us. And we are now uh, just completed our winter program, our second program, and we're about to start our summer drill program of 10,000 meters, which we will begin in late June and drill all the way through to probably the end of August. So with that, I am going to uh, go over to our uh, our questions and start answering some of the questions that our, our, our audience have been asking right now. So first of all, thank you to the audience members who are reaching out and asking us questions. I see a number of questions lined up, so I'm going to dig into some of those and let Sean answer a couple of those. So number one, uh, hey, hey, Chris, uh, great to see you on the call here today. Uh, your question is, you know, do uh, a lot of companies are announcing drill programs in the summer and sometimes they get started in the late summer. Uh, depending on, on the size of the program and how many meters they want to do, they might start later in the summer when the ground's, you know, harder and drier. Um, we've got a large program to do, so we're going to begin right in, as soon as we can, which is towards the end of June when uh, it's starting to dry up and we can actually get our, our vehicles on that access mode and access those areas we can by a vehicle and helicopter the other ones. Uh, we have a, a large program, and it's important to note that uh, it's really important. I think Sean touched on how crucial it is to have uh, key vendors working with you. And as many of you probably realize, you know, not just uranium, but all the other uh, mining sectors are really starting to move and companies are getting financed and they're all wanting to do drill programs. And it's going to be crucial to make sure that you're able to access um, all the vendors that you're going to need to run your program. And we're going to be announcing very shortly once we finalize contracts with our vendors. We've already in, you know, strong communication and we know we've got verbal commitments from all our vendors but we've got our helicopters we've got our drillers we've got our camp we've got our geos all lined up so we're lined up for a remarkable summer program and to have um you know the top drill companies with their top teams drilling our programs is uh it's really important and we're proud that we've got that lined up so thanks for that question chris uh any other ask a question about um where are all entertaining costs for production to be per pound um uh, any other, we're just way too early to answer that question. We have to get much further down the line now to be able to get into that region. So um, that's something you see once you get to a feasibility study. So we're not there yet. So we can't, I can't give you an answer on that one. Uh, Richard has got a question about uh, permitting environmental issues. Um, let me start off by saying we are fully permitted. And not only are we fully permitted, we have full uh, First Nations consent, which is crucial these days. You're going to notice um, over the immediate future in this region of Saskatchewan, you don't just need permitting anymore. You now need to have your First Nations consent and have a strong relationship to work forward with them. Um, there are several companies that don't have that yet and weren't able to get winter programs going. And uh, for us, we're, uh, we work very hard at building relationships and building trust with our First Nations partners, and our relationships are extremely strong. And if you care to go back and look at our, our website or our Twitter page, you can see myself and Chief Teddy Clark talking about how uh, strong that relationship is and the things we've done to build that and to build trust. Environmentally, uh, we're right on track. We have no environmental issues at all. Everything we're doing is uh, top notch, and we're very proud of that as well. Uh, we've got a question here from Brad Neal. Hey, Brad, another shareholder. Um, how much uh, cash do you have left and when will you finance? So uh, one of the things that's important to know right now, we've got about 3.4, 3.5 million in our bank account right now. Our summer program is probably going to be somewhere in that range of 3 to 3.5 million. Uh, we could go ahead and drill that right now without doing any financing. Uh, we're constantly in conversations with investors, with fund managers, with bankers that are um, you know, making offers to us on how we could finance. So we're looking at those. We're discussing those. We don't have any immediate plans to raise money right now. We want to see our share price move up a bit and make sure that we're doing it non dilutive as possible, but at the same time ensuring we've got the cash to move forward uh, safely and securely and make sure we're well positioned to do that for our shareholders. Uh, Mike's got a question. What's the cost of drilling this summer? Uh, I'm going to let Sean answer this question. Now, he can sort of walk us through uh, costs of our program compared to winter or summer drilling and what that looks like cost per meter. So, Sean, why don't you hop in and answer this one? 
Sure. Uh, I mean, that's a good question. There's a lot of different variables that need to be considered. Um, helicopter time is obviously very expensive, so that can drive things up during summer programs if you're relying on helicopters. Um, so, you know, in general, winter drilling or road accessible drilling, uh, whether it be winter or summer, is usually cheaper. Um, as I mentioned, we you know, we put in our access trail, which is about 35 kilometers of, of new trail through the bush up there. So, um, you know, that's that's an investment in itself. Um, and, you know, all those different kinds of things, any delays that you run into with, you know, the minus 50 freezing up water lines and stuff that all kind of drives things down. Um, but, you know, there's there's different uh you know if drill moves are shorter it depends on where you're drilling as well there's there's so many different factors uh it's kind of hard to to put an actual number on that but um usually winter could be cheaper if you're doing everything road based and uh not relying on the helicopter in general i would say and then it's the second part expectation on fast tracking the discovery uh, by utilizing the experience and data of other companies like NextGen and other companies. So, yeah, okay. So that's a, a good a good one as well. Like, you know, as John alluded to, having myself, uh, Garrett and Galen on the team, you know, we've worked in this area a lot. We know the rocks. I get, like that's, that's, you know, pretty invaluable to the company already. Just having that experience all together, you know, 20 plus years of experience between all of us. Uh, I just published a paper on Arrow. And, you know, so having that knowledge in the areas is crucial and how these deposits work. Um, and then another another thing that will play into that is, you know, we're, we just quadrupled our summer program. So we're going to hit it hard. Obviously, you know, the more we drill, the, the quicker we'll potentially make that discovery. Right. So that's that's going to kind of fast track us as well. So super excited about that. And uh, you want to take that last part, John? Sure. So the last question comes to us from Justin. Have you seen the results for the latest of drill that just finished up? Well, we see the core when it comes in, and we scintillometer that, and we've got good readings on that. But the assay results, we won't get those until mid-May. So uh, once those results come back to us in mid-May, that will allow Sean and our geotechnical team to be able to build out our model and be able to plot those next uh, drill targets specifically. We've got a good idea based on our geophysics where we're going to be drilling, but uh, once we're into our LeapFrog software system, we'll be able to identify exactly where we're drilling. And those assay results we will publish in a news release come uh, mid-May once we have them. So I think that's uh, some of the questions so far. Dasha, you may have received a few other questions. I'll turn that back to you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. And thanks for going through your presentation and the Q&A. Um, we did get some questions emailed in. So um, if we can just go over some of those. Um, I was wondering if, Kiyum, can you please explain the previous financings of Standard Uranium? Sure. Uh, okay. So we started this company roughly as a private company at the end of 2017. Uh, initial shareholders put in uh, $500,000 and secured the David River project. Uh, they came in at five cents for those, uh, five cents uh, for the shares and for, for the warrants. Uh, since that time, we have uh, those warrants have all been exercised. So the next financing, the next two financings were did were done at 15 cents with a 25 cent warrant. Those were done in 2018 and 2019. And then we did our most recent two financings in 2020, and those were at 20 cents, and, and those uh, warrants were at 30 cents. So we now have uh, the only warrants that are outstanding. Uh, we've got a couple of 20 cent uh, broker warrants, and then we've got, uh, I think, 8 million uh, warrants that, or sorry, 11 million warrants that are at 25 cents, and then we've got uh, we've got 18 million warrants at 30 cents. So those are the financings we've done previously. Uh, question coming Great. from Paul Hamilton, management and the board own at just over 5%. And if you include um, some insiders, some people who are, who are locked up, it's much higher, probably closer to 10%. Thanks for that question, Paul. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, Indriel, can you just talk more about Saskatchewan? Is it a good place to operate? Okay, great. So that's a nice question, Dasha. So overall, if you look globally at how uh, different regions of the world are classified for, you know, levels of, uh, you know, easily to operate, Saskatchewan is always ranked near the top two or three in that, which is great to see. Um, for us, uh, being able to operate in Saskatchewan, we've got great relationships with not only the government, so we do all the permitting processes, that's done exceptionally well, 
And then on top of that, we're now working closely with our First Nations partners. So not only do you need to have your permitting from the government, you now also need to have consent from the First Nations groups that you're working with. And that's a pretty recent transition over the last few years. So for us, what we're very proud to say that we've got excellent relationships and we've got consent on our projects and we're moving forward with that. So I hope that answers that question. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, there's another question here from Mike, if you want to um, address that one. Uh, okay. What do you expect new long-term utility contracts to be done? Thank you. That's a, a macro question. We're looking overall at, uh, you know, when do we expect the utilities who run nuclear power plants to sign long-term contracts for the uranium supply? Um, you know, if you look at what, uh, not just our opinion, but what other analysts and what other, um, I guess, fund managers are talking about. And if you look specifically to Tim Gitzel from Chemical, who will be one of the guys signing those contracts. He is clearly stating that he's not going to be signing long-term contracts anything le less than fifty dollars. So right now you look at long-term contracts that are on the books of uh, mid thirties. So we expect those long-term contracts to be done at fifty dollars, and that's just for the top-tier projects. And once you start working down into the mid-tier and lower-tier uranium uh, mines, you're going to need dollars up in the up in the high sixty to seventy dollars to be signed for long-term contracts to make those mines be viable. So those are the numbers we think are um, realistic. And the bigger question is, you know, when will those contracts start to be announced and signed? Uh, we, we believe those contract negotiations are going on right now. And two, three of this year could be when we start, or really soon we start to see some of those contracts being announced. And those are often kept confidential, but those numbers tend to trickle out to the public um, through, through financial filings and so forth. Right, absolutely. Um, I was wondering, um, how is your project different than the other 15 junior explorers in Saskatchewan? Oh, okay. Thanks, Tasha. So it's a great question. So when we look at you know all the different regions of uh, Saskatchewan, where you want to be and what makes projects exciting, uh, one of the things that's really important to us is you want to be in a region that has had recent uh, high-grade exploration projects. So if you look in our corner, we've got Nextone and Fission, which are very close to us, just kilometers away from us. Now that's that's really nice to say that we're in the same area. That's not really that important. What's important is that those same um, discoveries, as well as pure point spitfire discoveries, they all sit on the Patterson Lake conductor. And for us, we understand that that same conductor runs from the northeast and runs southwest and runs right through our data to river project. So not only are we in the same region, but we are, we're sitting on the same conductor that hosts those incredible world-class discoveries. So for us to have a project that's not just close, it's on the same conductor, and now when we're putting drill holes into that project, we're starting to realize that we're in the same rock formation, but very similar to those other, those other discoveries that were made next door. So there are many regions of Saskatchewan and some, some parts where you don't have um, exciting conductors with big discoveries right next door. So that's one of the reasons we like the Davidson River Project. One of the reasons the team we built is part of our team. They understand that as well, and they're excited to be part of our team and, and exploring the same conductor on our Davidson River Project. So thank you for that question, Dasha. Right, absolutely. Um, do you anticipate more Uranian companies coming to Canada? <laughs> yes. So if yeah. you get back in time, first of all, there's about 60 companies globally right now that are Uranian exploration producers or developers. Uh, if you go back into the, the heyday, you know, back in the last big bull run, there were over 500 Uranium companies. And a lot of those were focused in Saskatchewan around the Atlantic Basin. So as we're starting to see companies now show up in uranium space being new uranium companies once this market really takes off and investors start to see how hot the uranium sector is we can anticipate there could be hundreds you know, literally hundreds of companies becoming uranium companies and trying to grab land in the Alcabasa nation so i i always tell investors look make sure that those companies that are becoming uranium companies in this region actually have uh, a project that's worthwhile. We actually have a geologist that actually knows about Athabasca Basin, has worked there, understands the, the specific geology in that region, and they aren't just uh, a lithium or a gold or a copper company that's automatically put uranium in front of their name when they have no experience in that region. Well, they've never even set foot in that region, so be very careful in identifying those, those specific companies and listen to the analysts and looking, listen to the fund managers. Who are those fund managers investing with, and why is that important? Really key things for uh, companies and investors to look for when they're identifying potential investment opportunities. Great, yeah, that's great advice. Um, John, can you explain why there has not been many holes drilled on the Davison River project? Oh, sure. So first of all, <clears throat> sorry, we, uh, we started this company in 2017 and the Davidson River, we acquired that uh, as part of uh, building this company 
The Davidson River project up until that point had not had a single drill hole on it looking for uranium. There was one hole on that was looking for oil and gas, which was done back in the, in the 80s. Now, if you go back in time uh, in the Saskatchewan region and you look at the Athabasca Basin, a lot of people believe that the uranium was all going to be found on the eastern side where MacArthur River and Star Lake are, or up north in the uranium city. And there was never really understanding that there could be uranium in the southwest corner until you know, a couple of companies took a chance and started exploring in that region. And a certain geologist in Garrett Ainsworth made a radioactive bull discovery. And that led to a staking rush from the southwest corner. So a number of companies all jumped into that region, staked land, started doing exploration programs. And that was right around 2012, 2013. And then you had <clears throat> Fission, um, you know, really moving on that uh, Triple R project. And then Next Gen came in a couple years later and really made their aero discovery. And the whole time, the Davidson River project couldn't be worked on. And I'll tell you why. It was staked by Jody DeRouge at that time. And he was actually working with Fission. He was the director of Fission and president of Fission. And he offered that project to Fission. And at the time, uh, their management team passed on it. They said, no, thanks, we're going to focus on the Triple R. Well, Jody decided to leave Fission later on. He left, and uh, Fission sued him for the Davidson River project. So for many years, three-plus years, it's tied up in court. So while the Arrow and, and the Triple R and Spitfire were being explored and many drill holes were going in, the Davidson River sat there untouched. So for us to be able to get it when it came out of the court ruling, 100% uh, in favor of Jody DeRouge, we did the project deal with Jody DeRouge. We took on the project and we started exploring it right away in 2018. So we're the first ones to actually get there and have the opportunity to put geophysics on and put drill holes into it. So it's a huge opportunity and a fantastic project to pick up in an incredible situation. Great, thank you so much. There's a few more questions coming in here. So Mike is asking, do you have any analyst coverage for standard uranium yet? Uh, yes, great question, Mike. So we do, we've got, uh, Ray Cloud and uh, David Talbot. So if you go back in time, uh, David Talbot is probably the number one uranium analyst globally. He has been doing this for many years, several years with Deep Capital, and he recently shifted over to Red Cloud, and uh, he is an analyst. So he can, you can watch for uh, his research on us as well if you go onto the uh, Red Cloud uh, site. Uh, question from Justin. What's the reason for increasing the summer drilling to 10,000 meters? And was that based on what you saw in your latest drilling? Uh, well, Yes and yes, uh, we heard the, the drill results that we saw, the core we were looking really got our geologists and myself excited about the potential of what we're looking at. We increased from 2,500 meters to 10,000 meters because we want to be really aggressive in uh, drilling this summer. So that is why we did that. And, you know, the assay results are coming out in uh, mid-May, so we can't speak for those, but the core that we're looking at and the structure we're getting to, the uh, stack shear zones, the different rock formations, the structures and alterations, it's all getting more and more exciting with each drill we're putting in the ground. So we want to take this opportunity to, to be very aggressive and drill as many holes as we can on the road to making that next uranium discovery. Great, yeah, so in closing here, um, I was wondering why is this a good time to invest in standard uranium? Oh, okay, thanks, Dasha. Uh, I'll take that one as well. Um, so, as I as you go back to that slide that was uh, the song curve showing that we are pre-discovery. So, if you go back in time and look at other companies that were in this in this uh, same exact time where they were looking to make their first discovery, you know, share prices typically are in the low ten cents kind of range, and and that's when you want to identify a company that you believe was on the steps to making a discovery. Because when discoveries are made and you're making a high-grade basement hosting discovery, your share price can go from $0.20 cents to $2 to $3 to $5 in a very short period. So that is a huge opportunity for investors to make a lot of money with that company as they make a high-grade discovery. So for investors who believe in what we're doing, they understand the team we've built and the team that uh, has made discoveries in this region and they understand the opportunity with our share structure and uh, how close we are and, and the drill holes we're putting in, that is when investors want to take an opportunity to come along and invest with us. So that's the opportunity right now. Great, well, thank you so much, John and Sean, for taking us through the presentation and all the questions. And also thank you to everyone who joined it, joined us today and submitted all these great questions. If you think of a question afterwards, um, we will be sending out a short survey and you can leave your contact information and either John or Sean will follow up with you and answer the questions you have. There's also more information on their website at standarduranium.ca. So um, I'll pass it back to you, John, for the final word. 
Thank you, Dasha. So once again, thank you to Six and to Dasha for hosting us today. I do encourage you, if you have any interest in us or you want to share our story with your with your contacts or friends, go on to our, our social media channels. You can see Sean and myself talking a lot about uh, what we're doing at a project site and giving lessons on what's happening for those who have never seen what actually goes on in the drill site. Uh, so Sean does a great job of really breaking things down and taking your investors through what's happening. And come along and join us uh, and invest with us today.